Welcome to the, our webinar on Data Hub Probeware for the AP Environmental Science. And <clears throat> we are teaming technology with wet lab experiences for AP Environmental Science. This device is called a Data Hub. There are four different kinds. The one we're going to be using today is Environmental Science. It it um, contains most of the functionalities that you need for testing in this area. If you look on a <coughs> environmental science data hub, you'll see 11 different functionalities. It's ambient temperature, barometric pressure, colorimeter, dissolved oxygen, external temperature, GPS, IR temperature, pH, relative humidity, sound level, turbidity and UV radiation. Some of them require probes. There are three ways that you can use Data Hub in your classroom. The first of these ways is to check the, or to obtain the actual data for the experiment, which would be the dependent variable. Another way you can use it is place it, the Data Hub, wherever you're gonna use it, and in the experiment, and you can then get the independent variables associated with the experiment. And the third way is to give students ideas of how to use different variables or test different variables during the inquiry portion of the uh, AP labs. <clears throat> there are three ways that you can actually use Data Hub. The first of them is to actually read what's on the display here, or you can set it up to your computer. And the third is to use it wireless, wirelessly through an iPad device. So they're very easy to use, and I'm going to show you how to start. And the first thing you have to do is actually pair the iPad device with your Data Hub device. I'm going to show you kind of a quick way of how to <clears throat> pair that just to make it easy. Right now it is paired and the way that I know that it's paired is if I look at the side here, if you look at this symbol that looks very similar to the Data Hub, you can see that they look the same then you can see that there's this little Bluetooth symbol next to it. That means that it's paired and ready to, to uh, go. If not, then you just have to pair it, but it's really easy to pair. All you have to do is there are three buttons, and these buttons are actually described very well in the literature. I'm going to show you. They're visual literature um, where it tells you exactly what button to push. Rather than go through it, if you ever have any problems, you can certainly contact us and we can help you get connected. Um, all right, so if you look down the side, you'll see that there is a, a whole host of buttons to control your data hub, which is much easier than connect, just playing with the three buttons that's on the data hub here. So you can turn the data hub on and off and get individual readings just with the Data Hub, or you can connect it to the computer or the iPad. All right, once we're connected, which is uh, right now, then uh, it's wirelessly transmitting data, and so you don't have to worry about um, getting disconnected. If this ends up going, if your iPad goes to sleep, you might have to repair it, but like I said, it's actually a very quick process. All right, so let's start with the first lab. I'm focusing on the APES labs that uh, Wards has designed, but and they are not regulated like the, uh, they're not required certain labs like there are for the AP biology course. So we've tried to design labs that will cover most of the curriculum of uh, the environmental science APES. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is soil factor and with soil factor uh, there are <clears throat> in the kit 
because it's about soil. We're testing different soils. And as you can see here, in the kit comes topsoil, loam, and clay. And I've labeled them there. And so there's a whole host of ways that we can test them. We're gonna test them for porosity. We test it for uh, how much water is retained, porosity, uh, how, <clears throat> um, well, we'll go on in a second for the other ones. So the way that we can use the data hub with this, the first way is to actually go out and take samples of soil. So we've given you three soils from all over the United States, but you can go out to different parts of the, say in a garden or to a near a playground, or um, I wouldn't go dig up the uh, track field or something like that, but I'm sure you can find places to dig. So dig up different areas. And the first thing you wanna do is identify where that area is for certain that you've actually taken a sample from. And the way that you're gonna do that with the data hub is you're going to use the GPS that is um, built into the data hub to, so that they can mark and say exactly where their sample is being taken. So you can send out, let's say that you had six or eight data hubs, you could send it out with different people and they're going to take that uh, particular range, write it down and you can compare it between it to see, compare the differences even in that short distance and then use the samples that are actually in the kit to, to um, have an even larger range of options. Okay, so with GPS, there is one tricky part. If you go to the close, thank you. With, <clears throat> with the GPS, what you have to do is you actually have to enable the GPS on the data hub. It isn't always on. So if I turn on, these are the configurations, which is the buttons that I talked about before. And if I go to, if I go to uh, configuration, you can see that there's a G, nice GPS right in the middle. That GPS is what you're going to want to enable. So you go to GPS. Now you can see it's highlighted. I can click it and I can enable or disable, and you can see that it goes back and forth between them. Right now I have them enabled, and then I can just select it, and now it's ready to be used. Um, I would love to show you, it shows you latitude and longitude. It doesn't show you the altitude, but it does do the latitude and longitude. The only issue is that it goes by seeing three satellites, and because we're not outside, it's not going to work. I can't really show you the latitude and longitude working in here. All right, so the first thing you can have them do is do GPS. The other part of that is maybe look at um, the external temperature in the, or I'm sorry, in the ambient temperature of where they took it. And so that's just what it is for the air. You can also have them look at, say, the humidity. I didn't put that there, but you could also have them check the humidity in that area and then you could bring it back or before you bring it back you can go to check the ambient temperature now the ambient temperature oh i know what i forgot i forgot to show you this so as we start to read things besides the gps i showed you how to enable it but i didn't show you how to how to get to it the way that you get to it if you see all around here there is a variety of buttons and each of these have control usually one to two different um, functionalities. So this one is the UV sensor, and it also has a um, universal probe so that you can use it with your vernier uh, probes. Then there's a pH or, and dissolved oxygen, which we're gonna do in a bit. There's a sound and a barometric pressure, IR, the relative humidity, GPS, a temperature, and a um, colorimeter. So all those things that I mentioned before are now on here. And if you look at this, and I wanna go between two, this one says dissolved oxygen. If I hit this, it's now reading pH. Now, it can't read pH without a probe. So we'd have to connect the probe so that we can see that. But we're gonna to get to that in just a moment. The next one, or the first one we're actually going to test 
is the uh, external temperature. And why would you want to know the external temperature? Because one of the things that you can test is how much water is actually in the soil. So they could come back and actually bake some and see what the weight difference is before and after the experiment to see how much water was actually retained in the soil in the area that it was retrieved from. Part of that is we want to know what the temperature is, what the uh, temperature of the soil is as soon as they bring it back in. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to test where the temperature, it says temperature here, right? And each of these that I talked about have different probes or internal sensors that need to be um, accessed. So this one across from temperature is a um, just a plug-in port. So if I plug this in and I hit the button that I talked about before and I want external temperature, now if I put this in my soil, so I can take this probe, stick it in my soil, and now I can uh, take the temperature of what that soil is as compared to what the air is. And then some people are going to think it's going to be exactly the same, but what's nice is then they can see that how much um, warmth or how much cold, depending on what time of the year you take these samples, the earth actually um, has. All right, so that's external temperature and ambient temperature. The next one is pH. Why is pH important? Well, you know as environmental science teachers that depending on what the pH is, you have to test it in different ways. You might have to give it more um, if it's an alkaline soil, you might have to actually add acid to make it more suitable for um, growing. Or if it's an acid, acidic soil, then you might have to add more lime to make it more neutral pH to allow growth. So pH is really important. The easiest way to do pH, the kit that we have actually have strips, but the strips um, aren't as accurate as actually taking measurements, quantitative measurements, which is what this enables. So in order to do this one, you're going to take a pH probe, and it looks just like any other pH probe that you've ever used. It has the storage solution. I can pull it right out of the storage solution, and I can rinse it in my waste bucket. I can blot it if I had, there, I think that's good enough. Usually you're not going to contain that much. You're going to take the end. Now you're going to look for where it says pH, and you can see this one says pH right there and dissolved oxygen. Across from that is going to be a um, port that matches this end, and now it's connected well. And you can take, make sure that now it's still on external temperature, so you need to push pH. So now I have a pH number. It doesn't matter what the number is. And I can put it into the soil that's been mixed with water and see a pH reading. Okay. Then I can rinse between them, each of the soils, and they can test to see if the soils are different within the same around school grounds, or if they can test um, the different soils in uh, around that was given to the kit, given in the kit. All right, so that's pH. The next one that I wanna talk about is colorimeter. Why would you use a colorimeter to check the soil? You might wanna check if you wanted a more accurate amount or measure of what the uh, nitrogen content or the phosphorus content or basically any of the things that are listed on this chart that I've put on the uh, PowerPoint. I thought this chart was really kind of cool because it actually has a visual of how much to add of each of the chemicals to test for a variety of different soil components. Um, in the kit we actually have just strips that they can use but if they don't use the strips then, um, and they want to do it quantitatively, like I said, you can do it that way. Now, I don't have the reagents for the nitrogen or phosphorus, 
They're listed there. I've given a couple of them. And so you can do it that way. What I've done is I've just taken pH that was colored, as you can see, right? And if I wanted, if this was um, something like copper that you wanted to test, because copper is blue, then you're going to find on your data hub the picture of the cuvette. That's the colorimeter. It's also a, a turbidity sensor, so you can do it by turbidity or it has three different wavelengths built in and you can test it at red, green, or blue wavelengths. So I need to rotate this, as you can see, so that my opening is there for my uh, cuvette. My cuvette has a lid on it because liquids don't do very well in the data hub or the data hub will break. So you take your cuvette, you put it into the side like that, and then you can take a measurement. That one is red, and you can see there's a few more, and there's also turbidity. All right, and you can see that there. You can see it from that side too. Okay. All right, and that is uh, colorimetry. All right, so <clears throat> the next one I'm going to talk about is LC50. That's another one of our labs. I've kind of mixed them up a bit. Um, the I'll get rid of my soil. You can put it up to me, Chris, if you want. So <clears throat> uh, the ones I'm going to talk about now are kind of repeats of what we just talked about, but the uh, LC50 is about what's the lethal concentration to kill 50% of the population. And what we're testing is Daphnia. And you can test the ambient temperature. So where did you take the sample? Did the Daphnia get too hot? Did they get too cold? You can put them under different conditions. The relative humidity is another way that you can look at it. I don't think it would make much of a difference, but it's certainly something they can try. The pH, <clears throat> uh, once you make up your solution, so for this experiment, you would make up, I believe it's six different concentrations of copper sulfate and water. And um, I've made it a little easier to see. And once I made it up and I put my Daphnia in, I actually put them in a, um, Petri dish. Can I show, this is the one thing that's in here. So Daphne are in there and you can see them kind of swimming around. They've been sitting there for a while so they're pretty content. Um, in order to test this, you add mug sugar and if they are healthy, they'll actually glow. And it's hard to show that on camera, so I'm not going to show that. Um, but after they've been exposed to the toxin, the uh, copper sulfate, then they are, take the sugar up or they don't take the sugar up. And if they do, they will glow. And they'll be, uh, they, you can test it at what point or what concentration of the copper sulfate did it kill them, 50% of them. All right. Um, so <clears throat> as we test those, before we actually put the Daphne in, you could do the pH and see if the copper sulfate addition changes the pH. You can also check the dissolved oxygen um, at different stages because we know that they are going to need oxygen to breathe. So is it the oxygen uh, going away that's preventing it them from living? So you can pinpoint it just to the poison, or is it because of some of these things that maybe that has uh, affected? The one thing I can say too, is that when you go to test these solutions, it's better to test the solutions before you add the Daphnia. The Daphnia have a carapace on it, and if you happen to introduce uh, bubbles or air underneath that carapace, they're going to die anyway. So try to test the solutions before you actually um, 
add the critters. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, one more. Let's go back one more second, thanks. The other thing you can do is if you do this as an introduction, now you can actually take another poison, a poison they don't know about. It can be anything. It could be a, a weak acid or whatever you choose to, desire, to test. And you can take it and then stage different collection sites around the classroom and say, you know, this is the source of the river. This is the mouth of the river. Where did the pollution get introduced? And you can do it tested in the same way and see where is it at the strongest, what at, how far from the source of the pollution did the concentration finally get diluted enough and do some uh, analysis that way. All right, uh, the next one is about ozone. And with the ozone experiment, you make starch papers and you test to see how much ozone is there it will turn, uh, it'll turn into iodine with the uh, presence of ozone. So you can test different places. So you'd use the GPS just like we talked about before. And a really important part of this experiment is the ambient temperature and the relative hum humidity where you are testing it. In the lab, they actually have you do a sling psychrometer and they, uh, the sling psychrometer will tell you if the humidity is higher at one point or another that you're testing it at because with the addition or the increase in humidity, sometimes it'll give you erroneous results with the, the paper strips that you're testing it with. So if you can control that by knowing what your relative humidity is with the sling psychrometer, or instead of the sling psychrometer, you can actually use the data hub. So for the data hub, you're gonna set this up and I'm gonna show you now how to set it up for an, an experiment. You could run it over time, over a period of time, or you could just take one sample. If you take one sample, usually it's better to do it just on the data hub. But if you wanna know exactly at the same time, then you set it up on your iPad and it will connect the two. So I said that what we wanted to control, we're gonna go into what looked like the data hub. There we go. That one where I said you could see the Bluetooth, okay? And there's all of those functionalities that we talked about before. Right now it's set up for GPS. See that's where it says on and it won't let me turn it off until I turn something else on because something has to always be available. So we are gonna test, we said um, humidity, and once I have humidity, I can turn that off. And I said another one that would probably be good to test would be the ambient temperature. So I've moved both of those. Now, depending on how many readings I wanna take, I can control the rate and I can control the number of samples. I'm just gonna put it kind of high so that it, you can see something. Okay, and now we're all set up and it's already communicated to the data hub so I don't have to do anything there. And the next thing I have to do to test something is see this little running man right there? I can hit the running man Oop, and I can control what uh, kind of graph it is. That's the measure, one kind of measurement, or I can do a line graph. Can you see the line graph? You can do a table of different measurements and you can see it taking data. If you had a GPS and we turned off the GPS, you can also look at a map and see where it is on the map, but we turned that one off. So we're gonna continue with the line. When I wanna turn this off, I just hit this hand with a stop. So we would expect that there's not going to be a big difference in the humidity and the temperature here. But if you were, I'll show you some ways to use this later when we get to um, something called, we called a walk in the park. 
All right, if we wanna see a difference though, what we can do is if I turn this on with the little man that I talked about before, right? And I breathe into where the humidity is. Do you see it's starting to spike? So that shows you how sensitive the uh, sensors are in the data hub. So that's a quick and easy way to get humidity and ambient temperature at the same time. Like I said, then you would correct for it in the lab. All right, um, next one. Thank you. So I talked about a walk in the park. The best, uh, the way that you can teach things like divergence and convergence and weather patterns and what does the radiation of a blacktop versus the radiation from a um, softball field or a uh, grassy knoll or you know all kinds of different types of surfaces you can actually send people send the students out with the data hub they walk around and they trace what we just traced so you can trace the ambient temperature you can trace humidity you can trace sound barometric pressure uv radiation as you go around and as you as you trace it you'll end up getting a nice profile of wherever they walked how did it change and by looking at that, they should be able to say what part was the parking lot? What part was that grassy knoll? How does that affect the weather? How does that affect um, the temperature, the uh, barometric pressure in that area? So it gives them a personalized approach to each of these and how they relate to each other. Uh, we also have a saved one that I'm going to show you in uh right now so the extra activity manuals on these data hub on the ipad application it has i told you a whole lot of folders over here if you look at the very bottom where there is a, a book open book it has a variety of activities and many of these are actually geared toward environmental science there's acid rain, and I've listed some of them, city microclimate, greenhouse effect. And um, if you click on one of these, it actually goes through. It's the teacher's guide. It gives you what you need. It gives you the standards, the objectives, vocabulary. So it gives you everything that you might need it also gives you that visual hands-on how to turn on the data hub and students can do it more easily and um, interpretations and conclusions so that um, they can do this experiment in the classroom now on the other part of this the top little folder that opens you can save your experiments for students that are gone or a lot of the ones that I just showed you actually have data already stored so you can use this data or have a student use this data if they're absent for some reason uh, or they just need more practice with analyzing data there's a whole variety of them listed here the one that I talked about before the walk in the park well there's all the data that was collected and then this is where it goes through and shows you all the temperatures in over a certain area as they walked it was cool here so they were in where it was forest foresty and then as it got hotter this would be where say a um, uh, blacktop is all right so the next one I've listed some other environmental labs that you can use uh, one is an exploring heat absorption lab activity so I've given ideas of you can use the IR and the, temp the ambient temperature or you can do the external temperature with um, surfaces soils water any of the materials then also the next one is about photosynthesis and if you're doing photosynthesis a nice way to do it and it's kind of an in not really inquiry I would say but uh, a problem because 
kids like, like mysteries. And if you look, I filled a couple of vials and the vials have plants in them. And so you can put one plant in the light and one plant in the dark and then come back and have them tell you which one was the one that was in the dark and which one was in the light, depending on what the pH is, okay? Uh, if you have a pH indicator in there and you wanna test the pH indicator, you can do that as well with the colorimetry. So you could put it in the cuvette and then check and see uh, which one has more oxygen based on what the change in uh, pH is. Okay, if you have trouble with any of that, you can certainly contact us and we can help you, uh, help you out with that. The last one is solar energy lab activity. And there you might wanna test how much solar radiation are you actually introducing to the experiment. And you can do that with the UV sensor or you could check what the ambient temperature is um, in the environment that you're testing. The next one is about mainly about pollution. What I think that these are really good for is taking them out into the environment and actually doing pH at, in water that's standing versus water that's running, it's cold versus hot. So you can take it and do the dissolved oxygen probe now the dissolved oxygen probe can be, um, they always can be a little bit finicky. Uh, the dissolved oxygen here has the end exactly like the pH. I'll show you, like I said before. So the ends, oh, thank you. So the ends are the same. So that's why when you look on the data hub, they use the same spot. All right. so. You would do it just like you did the pH. You would rotate, place it, and now change it to dissolved oxygen at that spot and test your, um, test your solutions. Okay. Um, and then you can do colorimetry to test some of the other, uh, those nitrogens and the chemicals that we talked about before, or you might want to just use the turbidity sensor and see how much organic matter is in that stream, because that's important also, because that's also going to have an effect on dissolved oxygen and um, sustainability of the like fish and things in the streams. Uh, the last thing I have listed there is a website that I found very interesting. It's a uh, scistarter.com slash SMAP. It is a, a citizen science site. So you can go on there and they collect data from all over the United States slash world. And you can, um, they are doing say temperature and humidity from the satellite, but they're asking for people on the ground to actually do the measurements too so that they can compare the two. And there's a bunch of different uh, types of experiments listed on there that you can participate in. It's just a way for those students that need a little extra to uh, be able to stretch themselves. And this is uh, where the wardside.com data hub, you can see the link there. It gives you more information, there's more videos. And there's also our website if you have any questions about any of the products that I've talked about today and all the five kits that we actually specifically made for the environmental science program. Well, thank you for your time, and I hope you learned something and found a way to be more quantitative about your environmental science classroom. Thanks.